Welcome back into the town meet as we continue in our study of how to study the Bible. This is course B, BI 210, how to study the Bible. And so we go back to where we were left off in our last class. And I want to draw your attention as a quick as a quick reminder that we're looking at the attributes of the Bible. We're looking that the Bible is infallible. We're looking at that the Bible is inerrant. And we're looking at that the Bible is complete. We're also looking at the Bible that it is authoritative in our lives. And we're looking at the fact that the Bible is sufficient. Now, this is where we were in, at, toward the end of our last class. We said that the Bible was sufficient for, for a number of things. We said for salvation. We said for perfection. We set for hope, and we set for blessing. This is where we left off in our last class, and I want to go right back that the Bible is sufficient. Open your Bibles to James chapter 1, verse 25. And in James chapter 1, 25, and I think this is a tremendous text for us to look at very carefully, in that it is sufficient for blessing. Now, in James chapter 1, look at what he says in verse 25. But the one who looks intently at the perfect law the word of God, the law of liberty, that's the scripture, and abides by it, not having become a forgetful hearer, but an effectual doer. An effectual doer, this man will be blessed in what he does. Now, that's absolutely tremendous, and it's great, right? Because when you read it and then do it, see, that, that's the challenge that man has, is that not only do we read the word, but you have to do it, okay? You're blessed. That's what he says. Now look at verse 21, in James 1 21, just go back up four verses and look at what he says. He says, because James says that we should therefore, look at verse 21, therefore putting aside all filthiness, all that remains of wickedness, in humility, he says, receive the word implanted, which is able to save your souls. Now the Greek text the Greek text of verse 21 literally means, it, it says, save your life. That's literally what the text says. Okay? So in other words, we, it says, it will save your life if you do what? If you receive the fullest life imaginable. That's what he's talking about. Okay? But it is, also, it is also possible okay, for a Christian that doesn't obey the word of God, to lose his life. Now, listen to me carefully. I'm not talking about losing your salvation. We're talking about losing your life. Look, let me let me give you an example of this. Turn your Bibles to 1 Corinthians chapter 11. 1 Corinthians chapter 11. I want you to see this very, very carefully with me in 1 Corinthians chapter 11. And let's go down to verse uh, 30. Verse 30. Look what he says, okay? Because... In 1 Corinthians chapter 11, the Apostle Paul is speaking to the issue when they gather together for the meal, for the supper, and the Lord's Supper. Remember that? And some of the Christians in the Corinthian church had violated the Lord's table. Now, this, these were believers. This is not, these are not unbelievers. And notice we're talking about the veracity, the authority of the Word of God. And that it is sufficient for what? Sufficient for blessings, sufficient for life. Now, in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 30, I want you to see this because he, the Lord, God had to take them home because they had violated the word of God. Look what he says in verse 30. For this reason, many among you are weak and sick and a number sleep. Now, we know that the word sleep there means they're dead. Okay? So you don't lose your salvation, but there are times when God's going to have to take you out because of your attitude. Now remember, you did not earn your salvation. You had nothing to offer toward your salvation. You got no merit to earn, to earn your salvation. In fact, the only thing that we give to, to the Lord, okay, in our salvation, okay, is our sins. Now, we are, even the gift of faith, which is what Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8, 9, and 10 talks about, is that we're given the faith to believe so God initiates salvation. God gives us faith for salvation. Not something that we conjured up on the inside for ourselves. Nevertheless, so if you are a believer and you find yourself in a constant state of disobedience, there's going to be a, a time when God just simply has to take you out of this world. 
Now, let me give you another example. And unfortunately, a lot of people don't believe these people were believers, but they were. Turn your Bibles to the book of Acts. Open your Bibles to the book of Acts, chapter 5. Let's go to, let's go to the book of Acts, chapter 5, okay? And I want you to see this with me, because it is crucial for you to understand this. In Acts chapter 5, we see in verses 1 through 11, well worth the read, and we should read it. So let's read this here, because we have two people here, Ananias and Sapphira, okay? Ananias and Sapphira, okay? Um, they, what did they do? They disobeyed God's command and literally dropped dead, literally, right? in front of the whole church. These were not unbelievers from outside the church. These were believers inside the church. Let's read the story and understand this. Acts chapter 5, starting in verse 1. But a man named Ananias with his wife Sapphira sold a piece of property. No one asked him to. They did this on their own initiative. And kept back some of the price for himself with his wife's full knowledge and bringing a portion of it, he laid it at the apostle's feet. He could do that. But the apostle Peter confronts him and he says, Ananias, why has Satan filled your heart to, a lie, to, the, to lie to the Holy Spirit and keep back some of the price of the land? Look at verse 4. While it remained unsold, did it not remain your own? And then he says, And after it was sold, was it not under your control? Why is it that you have conceived this deed in your heart? You have not lied to men, but to God. And as he heard these words, Ananias fell down and breathed his last, and great fear came over the whole, over all who heard it. Look at verse 6. Now, before we get to verse 6, Ananias and Sapphira made a decision that they were going to sell a piece of property and that the proceeds, whatever that money that they sold it for, they were going to come back and give it to the apostles to help the church. The apostles didn't ask for it. They didn't force them to do it. They were not conjoled, manipulated into it. This is something that they decided on, on their own. But when they saw the great price that they were able to sell the piece of property, they didn't give everything. They held back some. At that point is where they crossed the line and lied to God. And now pick it up in verse 6. The young men got up and covered him up. And after carrying him out, they buried him. Look at verse 7. Now there elapsed an interval of about three hours. Three hours later. Now his wife has no idea he's died. About three hours later, his wife came in not knowing what had happened. Verse 8, and Peter responded to her, tell me what you sold the land for such and such a price. And she said, yes. She said, yes. <laughs> and, and, and that was the price. Look at verse 9. Then Peter looked at her and said, why is it that you have agreed together to put the Spirit of the Lord to the test? And behold, the feet of those who have buried your husband are at the door. Now you can imagine she's hearing this for the very first time. And he says, and he, and he said this, he said, look, behold, the feet of those who have buried your husband are at the door, and they will carry out as well. And immediately, look at verse 10, and immediately she fell down at his feet and breathed her last. And the young men came in and found her dead, and they carried her out and buried her beside her husband. And great fear, look at this, great fear came over the whole church and over all who heard of these things. See, the scriptures, the Bible, is sufficient for blessing. That presupposes, pre-assumes that we have obeyed the word of God. Again, let me repeat this so you don't misquote me. They did not lose their salvation, they lost their life. So when James talks, go back to James chapter 1. And look what he says here. In James chapter 1 and verse 21, please. Look at this very carefully, okay? So when James spoke, he said this. If you receive the engrafted, the implanted word, and you obey it, and you continue in it, it has an incredible way of perfecting you, of blessing you, or saving your life. Now, that's a paraphrased version of it, okay? Now, all of these things are true of the Word of God. 
So we're talking about how to study the Bible. First, we have to understand how to approach it, and we have to understand its content. What does it actually say to us? And once we grasp what it says to us, now we're held accountable and responsible okay, for obeying it. Now, I want you to look at now the next thing. Now, here's what we did. We looked at the attributes of the Bible, right? We looked at, number one, that the Bible is infallible in its totality. We looked at, number two, that it is inerrant in all of its parts. Inerrant in all of its parts. In other words, in all 66 parts of it. Okay? And then we looked at, number three, that the Bible is complete. It doesn't lack anything. We can't take away from it, and we cannot add from it. And we said, number four, that the Bible is authoritative. It is or it is not. And then we said, number five, that the Bible is sufficient. Sufficient. Now we come to number six, that the Bible is effective. It is effective. I want you to see this with me very carefully. It is effective. Now I want you to turn your Bibles to the book of Isaiah. In the book of Isaiah, we're on the point number six, in which is that the Bible is effective. Look at Isaiah chapter 55, verse 11. Now, listen to the words of Isaiah chapter 55, verse 11. Now, we obviously, every time we pull, we read a verse, and much, much, much of the time, we're pulling out of his context to draw and highlight uh, and to accentuate a, a specific principle, of course. Now, unlike what we just read in Acts chapter 5, where we actually read the whole thing in its context. But I want to draw the principle, extrapolate from it, the principle that we find here in Isaiah chapter 55, verse 7. Let's read it. So will my word, which goes forth from my mouth, this is God speaking, it will not return to me empty without accomplishing that which I desire and without succeeding in the matter from which I sent it. See, the Bible is effective. It does, it goes forth from the mouth of God, and it does exactly what God wants it to do. That's absolutely incredible. That's great. God's Word is effective. Do not deny the, 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 okay, the effectiveness of the Word of God. Now, one of the incredible things mm -hmm. about being a teacher of the Word of God is that, listen to me, that it will do what it says it will do. That should scare us. All of us who teach and preach the gospel of Jesus Christ, all of us who teach the full counsel of the Word of God, from Genesis to Revelation, Revelation back to Genesis, okay, all of us should be shaken to understand that, 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 that the Word of God will do what it says it's going to do. Do not toy, do not play with the Word of God. So here's my question. Is your product effective? Is your product effective? effective. It should be. Now, let me share a story. In some time ago, I don't remember even where I read it, honestly. You know, I'm, I, I read a lot. I just, I do. I just read and read. I, I read a lot. Right? Um, and because I do read a lot, then, you know, I cut here and I cut there and I, and I, and I, and I pick up a story here and I pick up a story there. And, and what I'm looking for is the essence of the story. And then usually what I do, I'll write down the, uh, uh, if it's a newspaper article or something, I'll write down the author, uh, the name of the paper, and the date, and so forth, and so forth, okay? And um, and then I'll share that with somebody else, and so forth. And somewhere along the line, sometimes I'll lose um, the author, wh wh you know, where I got it from. But nevertheless, I'm looking at the essence of it, the substance of it. What does it communicate? So here's the question. Now, we just said that the Bible is effective, right? Now, my question to us mm -hmm, is this. Is your product effective? And here's a story that I picked up and I wanted to share with you because it, it, it drives the point home. Okay? And I do. And I often wonder uh, about the door-to-door -door salesman. And there was a story that I picked up and it was talking about um, a salesman. Now, I remember the context of it is that um, there was a commentary that was being given about the book, and I remember years ago, I don't even remember when the book was published, okay? Uh, do you remember uh, The Death of a Salesman? Do you remember that story? And I remember I was in school back then, okay? Now, can you imagine? I've been out of, I, I've been out of college when I graduated my bachelor's degree 45 years ago, okay? So it was before that. I was in high school, okay? and it was, it was The Death of a Salesman, okay? The Death of a, a Salesman. But there was a commentary about that book 
And in the middle of that comment, in the middle of that commentary, another story was shared. And this is the story that I want to share with you. Now, go back. The Bible's effective. And is your product effective? Right? So, let me share with you. I wonder about the door-to-door -door salesman who tries to demonstrate his product. And then it doesn't work right. I always remember the lady who lived in the country and a vacuum cleaner salesman came by with a high pressure sales pitch. He said, hey lady, I've got the greatest product you've ever seen. This vacuum cleaner will eat up everything. In fact, if I don't control it, it will suck up your carpet. Before she could say anything, he said, lady, I want to give you a demonstration. So, he immediately went out to the fireplace and threw some of the ashes in the middle of the carpet in her house. He also had a bag of stuff which he dumped on the carpet. And then he said, I want you to watch it suck up every bit of that. Well, she was standing there aghast, stunned, in shock. And finally he said to her, Lady, if it doesn't suck up every bit of this, I'll eat, I'll eat it all with a spoon. She looked at him right in the eyes and she said this to him. She said, well, sir, start eating because we ain't got no electricity. Wow. We ain't got no electricity. Is your product effective? He never even had a clue the possibility she had no electricity. Well, now that's pretty tough. I mean, you got a minute, right? That I mean that's pretty tough to get caught up in a situation where your product, okay, um, just doesn't work, right? But I want you to know something. That never happens with the Bible. That never happens with the Word of God, okay? It just doesn't. You know why? Because it is always effective. It will set out to do what it's going to set out to do. It will do what it says it's going to do. It always does exactly what it says it will do. Not 99% of the time, not 80% of the time, but 100% of the time. Now, now, that's the tremendous reality about the Scripture. And I want you to understand that. Now, let me draw your attention to 1 Thessalonians chapter 1. And in 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, I want you to see this principle that we're going to draw out of verse 5. 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 5, okay? And we see a great verse about the effectiveness of the Scripture. The effectiveness of the Scripture. You see, that's the reason why a lot of times I don't get into arguments with people over a whole lot of things, okay? Um, I'll just put them in the hands of Scripture. Because I know that the Scripture is going to do something in their life. Now, I may not see it. I may not witness it. I don't have to see it, and I don't have to witness it. But I know that the Word of God is going to do something in their life. Look, and I want you to see this verse because it talks about the effectiveness of the Scripture. Now, remember, now remember we're, we're, in this course, we're looking at how to study the Bible, how to study the Word of God, the Scriptures. Okay? And it's great. it is highly effective. First Thessalonians, First Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 5. Let's read it. For our gospel did not come to you in word only but also in power, in power and in the Holy Spirit, he says, with full conviction, just as you know what kind of men we prove to be among you for your sake. Now look at this, for our gospel, this is the Apostle Paul speaking, he says, for our gospel did not come to you in word only, he said, but also in power and in the Holy Spirit with full conviction. See, the word of God does not return unto him void. Look, in other words, when you hear, when you hear the Word of God, it isn't just words. It's not just words. Right? And, and that's the thing that we kind of forget. We kind of forget that. It's not just words. Listen, this is not just um, black ink on white paper. Now, all the books in my library, okay, it's black ink on white paper. But this is the Word of God. This is spirit and truth, spirit, and life. This is what I want you to understand, okay? I want you to understand this, okay? So, when the Word of God goes forth, okay, it has power. It has power. It is powered by the person of the Holy Spirit. 
And that's the thing that we need to comprehend. Right? And we have the assurance that it's going to do what it says it's going to do. Now, let me, let me, let, let me, let, let's kind of just reset the dial here for a moment. So, so far, what have we said? We have said that, and we have seen that the Word of God is infallible in total. We said that the Word is inerrant in its parts. We said that the Bible is complete, so nothing needs to be diminished or needs to be added to it, okay? And we said that the Word of God is authoritative, okay? So that whatever it says, it is absolutely true. And it commands our what? Our obedience. Listen, and we and we said that it is sufficient, so that it is able to do to us for everything to do to us everything that we need. And we said that the Bible is effective; it will do exactly what it says is going to do. Now, finally, let's pick up this next section, number seven. The Bible is determinative, determinative. Okay, D E T E R M I N A. T I V E determinative. Okay, the Bible is determinative, right? and I want you to understand the Bible is determinative because of how you respond to the Word of God, how I respond to the Word of God, how many respond to the Word of God. Okay, determines the essence of your life and determines your destiny. Look, let me show you. Open your Bibles to the New Testament. Go with me to John chapter 8. And I want you to see this because Jesus is speaking in this section of Scripture. Let's go to John chapter 8 and look at verses 47. Look at verse 47. It's, just a, it's a great verse because Jesus said, He who is of God. That presumes you are of God. I'm of God. We are of God, right? He says, He who is of God hears the words of God, okay? For this reason, you do not hear them because you are not of God. Look at this. This is absolutely incredible. In other words, the determination, let's put it this way, the determination of whether an individual is of God or not is based on whether he listens to the word of God. Listen, unbelievers as a rule just don't listen to the word of God. You remember when he said in 1 Corinthians, uh, in chapter 2, verse 14, when he says, he says, a natural man cannot perceive the things of the spirit. Remember that? Okay. Well, you see, an unbeliever usually doesn't listen to the word of God. Now, I understand there are exceptions, but believers are supposed to be listening to the word of God and how horrendous it is that many of them don't spend enough time in the Word of God. Look, so let me repeat this. In other words, the determination of whether an individual is of God or not of God is based on whether he listens to the Word of God. This is the essence of what Jesus is saying here in John chapter 8, verse 47. He says, he who is of God hears the words of God. For this reason, you do not hear them because you're not of God. Turn your Bibles to 1 Corinthians chapter 2. Now, in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, I want you to see this in verse 29. Look at what he says in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, no, verse 9, verse 9. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 9. But just as it is written, things which the eye has not seen, the ear has not heard, and which have not entered into the heart of man, all that God has prepared for those who love him. Look, if we're honest, man could never conceive. Man could never conceive of God's dominion on his own. First of all, we were never created him in our own mind that way. We would have made him subservient and submissive to us. See, man could never conceive that he would be a part of it, of God's dominion, his kingdom. Right? In, see, man could never conceive of his own humanness, let alone God. Man couldn't conceive of his own humanness. He couldn't even conceive his own patterns of logic. Okay, All that God has prepared for him. He just, there's no way you and I could have ever conceived of any of that. Now, we just saw that. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 9, right? Look at this. He says, But just as it is written, things which the eye has not seen, the ear has not heard, 
and which have not entered into the heart of man, all that God has prepared for those who love him. Let's continue. Look at verse 10, 11, and 12. 10, 11, and 12. 1 Corinthians chapter 2. He says 10 to 12. And this is what it says. For to us God revealed them through the Spirit. For the Spirit searches all things, even the depths of God. For who among men knows the thoughts of man except the spirit of man which is in him? Even so, the thoughts of God no one knows except what? The spirit of God. Now look at verse 12. He says, now we have received what? The spirit of God. He says, the spirit of the world, I'm sorry, he said, we have received the spirit of the world, but the spirit who is from God, so that we may know the things freely given to us. Now, just two more verses, go to verse 14. In 1 Corinthians 2, 14, but a natural, this is what I was mentioning to you, but a natural man does not accept the things of God. A natural man cannot perceive the things of God. A natural man cannot even understand the things of God. A natural man cannot even discern the things of God. Okay? For they are foolishness to him, and he cannot understand them because they are spiritually what? Appraised. They're spiritually appraised. Now, there are two kinds of people, right? The people who, number one, the people who receive, right? The things of God, right? We know that, right? And the people who just simply do not. The people who can receive and the people who cannot. There's two kinds of people. That's it. So the what let's talk about the unbelieving people, right? And the unbelieving people can't receive it. Why? Because they don't have what? They don't have the Holy Spirit. That's what they don't have. But the people who know God have what? They have the Holy Spirit, okay? And they receive the Word of God. You see, it is it is the determiner. It is determinative, okay? Do you, you see that? The Word of God is determinative. It makes a determination. So those people who receive the Word of God indicate that how? How does it mean? By their understanding. By their understanding, okay? Uh, 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 by their understanding of it, and they possess what the Holy Spirit, and that proves that they are believers. This is the reason why I, I, I don't understand believers who tell me, "Well, I don't understand the Word of God." Uh, something is probably wrong here. When they tell me that, look, I remember um, talking to a man, and let me just come to, to, to close here. I remember talking to a man who continually admitted that he didn't understand the Bible, okay, but he couldn't because he didn't have the one thing that was what necessary necessary to do what to understand it and and what is that that's the indwelling of the person of the holy spirit in his soul so the beauty the glory the capabilities of the word of god are presented to us in simple words it is infallible it is inerrant it is uh complete it is authoritative it is sufficient, it is effective, it is determinative. Now, somebody might come along and say, well, that's really great. Whoop-dee-doo. That really is great that the Bible makes all those claims for itself. Now, if all this is true, then I've got to find out what those principles are, right? But how can I really be sure that it is true? How can I be sure that it is true? Listen to me. That's the reason why, if you don't know Christ, you don't know the Holy Spirit, you'll never know the Word of God, which is the reason why it's just simply a dried up intellectual book that is absolutely confusing to you because you don't know who He truly is in your life.